I want to make this video because this is by far the most common mistake I see, you know, whenever people send me the music or meet up with a student or something like that. Mistake for lack of a better word because, you know, m music is music and as long as it sounds cool, I, I, I don't believe there is anything wrong with it. But most of the time, this one thing doesn't make the music sound cool, but just makes it sound, just, it's just plain weird, yeah? The one thing, you know, all beginners have in common, like most beginners, I should say, uh, including myself, you know, back back in the day when I started to work with orchestral libraries and such, is just going overboard with things. Sample instruments, they don't need anything, you know, they already sound good out of the box. You don't need to do anything. And for some reason, I don't quite know why, you know, the, there seems to be this kind of uh, misconception going around that you kind of need to mix these libraries and you need to do to do a lot of things, a lot of processing just to make them sound good. While this is not the case, you might start with some music that already sounds fine on its own and you end up breaking it, you know, ruining it, uh, trying to make it better while it doesn't need anything, you know, which is frustrating and heartbreaking to see. So I want to try and help you today by recreating this situation, you know, so that hopefully, you know, the next time you're not going to be making uh, the same mistake again, for lack of a better word. I'm going to be using this BBC Symphony uh, Orchestra library simply because it's going to be easier to recreate uh, this situation because it has lots of lots of possibilities to tweak microphone positions and such. So let's let's say you are writing a piece of music. I don't know, maybe something like this. Okay, I'm just gonna quantize this for now, just so that it's nice and tight, yeah, and just maybe kind of even this out a little bit, you know, without going into too much detail, you know, let's make sure we have an accent on the first beat every time. These two could come up as well, and this should hopefully be fine already. So let's record like a bass part or something. And then let's do something on the cellos, maybe something different. Violas. And now the second violin in between violin one and violas. Let's make sure everything is quantized to eight. Okay, so this is nothing special, yeah? But hopefully you can see that it sounds fine already. It doesn't it doesn't really need much. Maybe if you wanna if you were if you want to improve this a little bit, you could kind of tweak some of the um, um, s some of the velocities like we did before, just make them a little bit more even. But generally speaking, I think this is fine as it is. You know, it doesn't it doesn't really need much. But this is the point where people usually start to kind of go overboard. Let's say let's say the piece of music this piece of music ends like this. You're done with it. So maybe you start thinking, okay, so I, I should probably now be mixing this little piece of music. And if you're fortunate enough to have a library like this, you know, like BBC that has a lot of uh, microphone selections, you know, it's very easy to mess this up. <laughs> Yeah, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be BBC. Most sample libraries, you know, usually come with two or three selections like close mic, the tree mic, and maybe some of the ambient mics, something like that. But unless you know what you're doing, I don't think it's a good idea that you start messing with those too, mu too much, at least. Yes, as you see in this interface, we have a mix selection. Yeah, what this means is basically like a like a pre-mixed kind of microphone selection that includes already includes a lot of these microphones that you 
have in the interface. So this is kind of light on RAM, but also is meant to sound good. It's meant to be ready to go. Unless you're going for a very different kind of aesthetic or you don't like these selections at all, I recommend using the default selection. But let's say that's not the case. Let's say you hate this, you know, mix mic. You know, very often I see people doing stuff like this. Maybe just uh, starting with the close. Think, oh, okay, that sounds pretty cool. Let's add a little bit of the outriggers and the ambience to give it a little bit more space. Yes, that sounds that sounds fine. Oh, we have a leader selection. Let's add that as well in. Yeah, sounds pretty cool. Oh, close wide. Let's make the sound a little bit wider. Okay, and maybe you're happy with this. And then you move on to the next instrument, you know, violin two. And maybe you're thinking, okay, so this is a second violin. So maybe let's do something different. Let's go, let's go with the tree that we haven't used before. And maybe try something else. Let's go with the stereo. Yes, that's pretty cool. And maybe the balcony, let's make it sound a little bit more distant. And same. And same with the violas. With the violas, you'd be thinking like, um, I don't know, maybe I kind of like, I kind of like mix one for the violas. So, and what about the cellos? The cellos, they're not punchy enough. So maybe let's just push all the closed microphones and some of the sectional meads as well. Yes. And what about the bass? The, the bass maybe sounds a little bit soft to you. So maybe you'd go, let's try, I don't know, let's try for now mix two. Let's see how that sounds. Oh yes, that's much better, that's much better now. So, so now you basically ended up with an entirely different kind of, you know, setup for each instrument and let's see how that sounds like. Maybe it's kind of cool, but it sounds like really strange. It doesn't necessarily sound like a string orchestra anymore because because it sounds like all these instruments are, you know, kind of sitting in a very different space and they're not sitting in the position you would expect. Yes. So my advice would be if you don't want to use, you know, the default selection, you have all these microphones available, let's at least start, you know, with the Deca tree. Yes, that's always going to be your main kind of mic. For most kind of orchestral settings, you have like this three microphone, which is basically, you know, a set of three microphones above the conductor that are meant to capture the entire sound of the orchestra. Yes, so I would recommend that you start with those, yes, and then kind of tweak the sounds as you go. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to arm all these instruments here, yeah, like so, and I'm going to control, you know, um, the microphone positions with an external CC controller so that I can show you in real time how the sound changes. So now that I'm going to pull this down, this is going to affect the other instruments as well, right? So we said we're going to start with the tree. And this already sounds pretty good on its own, but I don't know, let's say this is a little bit too too distant uh, for you. You can change, you can, you can change some of the internal balances a little bit, maybe a, a little bit of the close mic, but what is important to me is that you add a similar amount for each single instrument, right? That you don't end up with a drastically different mix for, you know, each one of them. So I'm just going to pull up the close mic a little bit and see if I like it. If this is still too distant for you, you can just pull back the tree a little bit, yes. You get more of a studio sound. And maybe if you want to have a wider kind of spread, you know, add a little bit of the out triggers and the ambient, uh, and the ambient mic, like so. So this is a pretty good mix to me, you know, and uh, it's a different mix from the one you s we started before. But, uh, you know, these instruments still sound like an orchestra, you know, they sound like a string orchestra because they have a similar setup to each other. The second thing I see a lot of people doing is going overboard with equalizers and stuff. 
particularly adding a lot of top end like so. If you look at these little numbers on the side of the interface, you see that you, what, what these are are basically decibels, right? So basically by doing something like this, you ended up increasing the top end by 10 decibels, right? Which is crazy, right? So it's fine to do this, but just once again, be careful, you know, just maybe two or three decibels at the time, you know? And so something that works pretty well as well, just maybe cutting in between, you know, three and 4K. But once again, a couple of decibels, just don't do stuff like this. Otherwise it's just going to sound weird, like really strange, right? And also something you can do is cutting a little bit of the dirt uh, in the bottom end. You don't, you don't necessarily have information down there, as you can see from the analyzer, there's nothing. But just in case, you know, there is a, a low rumble, you know, that is not showing on screen, you can do this. Just And this is just going to give you a little bit more headroom, you know, in your mix if you, if you do this for every instrument. But once again, just careful. Yes, with these curves, just don't go crazy. Easy. Subtractive EQs most of the times work better than, you know, just doing boosts. But I still think that adding a little bit of top end, you know, is fine. Yeah, particularly for strings. So you might want to do this for violin one. You might want to do something very similar for violin two. Maybe leave the violas alone or cut a little bit of the meads. You know, violas can have a little bit of that nasal quality. And then for cellos and double basses, maybe cut a little bit of the top end. You don't necessarily need that, you know, because you, you get that from the violins. And what something I like to do for the double basses is just making a little bit of space for the cellos, you know, maybe just cutting a little bit here and cutting a little bit of the top end. And there I say, just boosting maybe slightly, ever so slightly, a bit of the bottom end. And this is hopefully a little bit better, but it's not like a drastic kind of change, right? If I were to mute all the equalizers, this is basically going to sound just a little bit more polished, but it's not going to necessarily give you an entirely different sound, right? Something just as common as going overboard with equalizers and mic positions is going crazy with the panning. You know, once again, you don't need to do anything. These instruments are already pre-panned, right? Like if you're using, as we established before, if you're using the Deca Tree as your main kind of mic, you know, that's supposed to capture, uh, you know, the whole stereo field in front of these three microphones. So these instruments are pre-panned. If you want to make the stereo image a little bit wider, you can do it within the plugin. As you can see, there is a pan knob over here that allows you to pan basically just the closers or the spot signals like so. So let's solo the violin. Right? Something like that. But if we put it back to the center where it was and do it, you know, in logic, like so, you see that it kind of changes the tone. Also, you know, just pro tip here, by default, the pan knob uh, is on balance. Yes, so you, you might want to change that to stereo pan so that you can basically shift the whole, you know, the whole stereo image. Otherwise, if you leave it on the default position, so on balance, like so, what you end up doing is just basically just changing the balance, literally, just lowering the volume from the right, um, just to shift the, the instrument on the left, but that you don't want to do that because you have some information that's being recorded on the right as well. So just change that to stereo pan and just do it this way. Yes, maybe just a little bit, just a touch if you want, but just don't go crazy with it. Don't do this. Yes, otherwise it's just gonna sound really strange. Once again, my advice would be if you want to give a, a sense of a wider kind of spread, do it within the pl plugin, either panning just the close, you know, uh, mic signals. Or the second option would be adding a mic selection like, you know, sides, for example, that is wider by default. But the main difference here is that you have this information being recorded, you know, being baked into the samples and not being added artificially uh, later on. And the next thing I see a lot of people doing is going overboard with compression, which uh, when it's overdone, you know, it can make the music sound pretty bad. So a couple of dBs of compression, I think is fine. Something like this, maybe. 
and just give it a wider kind of attack, 30 milliseconds, and the short release. So this is kind of natural, it's compressing the sound a little bit, but it's, it, it still has a very natural kind of feel. But doing something like this, it's just really bad, yeah? I, I think you can, you can hear it yourself immediately. Yes, you could take an extra step at the very end and apply some extra, you know, like an extra equalizer on the on the overall section. Something like this, maybe, just to give it a more modern sound. I was almost gonna forget, you know, uh, something something else I see very, very often is just going overboard with the reverb, which is just as bad as going overboard with compression. So let's, let me try to simulate that. Cinematic rooms, you know, the default kind of selection, yes? So... Now is we basically have no reverb. Yes, we can add a lot of reverb like this to all these instruments. This is just bad. This is just bad on so many levels because you're losing all clarity and you won't believe how much music so actually sounds like this. So just kind of dial it back a little bit and try to remember what it is that you're trying to accomplish with reverb, right? If the goal of adding reverb is just adding a little bit of glue to these instruments, you know, you could just leave it at about here. But if your goal with reverb is adding depth, you can use a couple of different reverbs to achieve the, sa the very same result. So I'm gonna add another instance of cinematic room, a medium kind of space, like this one, medium room, which is 1.5 seconds. And as I just pull them up, you'll hear them slightly going back into the room uh, without necessarily adding too much resonance, too much of that twinkly air that you don't really need. The difference is not night and day, just, just you know, the reverb is just making, just making, you know, these instruments sound more like a section, pushing them a little bit further back into the room, but it's not necessarily changing the sound of the samples. All right, guys, I hope this was useful. Maybe it was obvious to a lot of you people being ex experienced in producing, you know, orchestral music, but uh, I don't know, I felt the need of making this video because because I see so much potential in people's music and it could sound so much better by taking just a couple of simple steps you know simplify simplify there we go so uh thank you very much for watching and I'll see you on the next one bye